Well, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> you can find your seats. And as you uh, find your seats, if you want to take out your phone, your Bible that you have, however you access the scriptures, we're going to be in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 today. And uh, we're going through our series in 1 Corinthians called The Cross. Um, and really what Paul is trying to tell us, Paul was an apostle. Uh, he was one of the early church planters. His life was transformed through a relationship with Jesus Christ. He was actually a Jew who fought Christians, killed Christians, was even allowed by the Roman Empire to kill Christians, and then he became a Christian. Because God got a hold of his life, he recognized who Jesus was and surrendered his life then to tell the world how wrong he was and how right God was. And in 1 Corinthians, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, and if you remember the story that we talked about the last several weeks, Corinth was one of the chief port cities of the Roman Empire. It was a shortcut. Instead of going around the bottom of, this, uh, of the island and going down, you, you took, took a shortcut. And it was a major educational center. It was a major sports center. The second largest games, other than the Olympics themselves, happened in Corinth. And they had a huge amphitheater. They had a huge stadium that they would come and do these games. Corinth is actually very similar to the culture we find ourselves in today. You could get anything you wanted. There were tons of different religions and gods. There was even the temple to the goddess Aphrodite that had over 1,000 male and female prostitutes that would go out into the streets at night that you could follow and hire to worship. This was a city that was full of wickedness, and God said, I know they don't know what they're doing, and I want them to know me. I want them to be transformed. And so Paul went there, and if you remember, when Paul went there, he decided to go there differently than he had gone to some other cities. He decided to actually work as a tent maker. He went into the city, and he didn't take an income from the church. He actually worked as a tent maker so that they couldn't kind of dismiss him as one of those religious people that's trying to get money and make money off of other people. Because that was what was pretty prominent in the culture of Corinth, just like our culture today. And so Corinth, is this book that Paul writes, he writes to the church because he really wants them to understand one of the greatest messages and one of the hardest messages of all eternity, and that's this. Paul says, for the message of the cross is foolish to those who are perishing, but it is God's power to us who are being saved or to those who believe that the only way to be saved in this life and to be saved out of this life for eternity is through a relationship with Jesus. That is, a, that is an exclusive message, and Paul is giving that message in a city full of idols where you can worship whatever God you want and all paths lead to the same road, and Paul is saying, no, they don't. He is stepping into this culture to say, the message I have for you, if you don't actually, in your heart, come to a surrendered posture before the God of the universe, it's going to seem like the dumbest message in the world, the most foolish message in the world. That's what Christianity is. If you took all the religions of the world and compared them, they are all very similar. They're all based on one thing, and that's your ability to work your way to get to salvation. Your ability to work hard enough to get a good relationship with God and a good relationship with God's people and a good relationship with others. Every religion in the world except Christianity, that's the belief system. You get a set of beliefs, you do them, you do them, you do them, you measure up to them, and then someday you stand before God and say, look how awesome I am. Christianity says that is what God despises most. A life that thinks that you can be your own God and get something from God and manipulate God. And God says, I hate that. What I am going to do is actually set up a system in which you're so desperate, all you have is to cry out to me. And so the entire Old Testament of the Bible is simply God crying out, showing how foolish people are so that they cry out for a Savior to come who can save them because they can't save themselves. The whole New Testament is the picture of when that Savior came and then 
where we're to look back to when that Savior came. And so Paul is writing to this church in Corinth and telling them that whole message of the Bible, that you can't save yourselves, your gods, your lifestyle, your knowledge, it can't save you, and it can't fix the world you're in. Only a relationship with the God of the universe through his son Jesus Christ can do that. And let me tell you, that is an exclusive and foolish message to the rest of the world that's just getting along with one another But in reality, they just use one another. They're not submitted to anyone but themselves. And then they try to gather a few people that will submit with them to themselves so they can get something they want in the end using people. And God says, I won't be used. And if you're mine, I won't allow you to use people. And Paul is writing this letter to the First Corinthian church because the First Corinthian church has begun to use people. They've begun to turn a corner in which they came to know Jesus, but now they're using the things around them to actually use one another instead of serve God and surrender. So we go on, go to two slides. They go on to 1 Corinthians 1. At the very beginning of the book, in 1 Corinthians 1, Paul makes sure he gives this foundation. He says to to God's church at Corinth, Paul's like, this isn't our church. It's not my church. It's not your church. This is about the God of the universe. It's what he is building. He's sanctified in Christ Jesus and called his saints. He reminds them it's, it's God who sanctifies you or makes you holy or right, not you. He calls them saints even though they're sinners, even though they're in a mess right now in their church and they've got all this mess. He says, but you've got to remember that it's God that's making you into something you can never make yourself to be. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He says there is a heavenly family that's trying to extend grace and peace to you. He goes on and he says, I always thank my God for you because of God's grace given to you in Christ Jesus. It's not a grace you earn. It's a grace, it's a free gift given. He says, I hope that God enriches you in everything, especially the way you speech, in your speech and the way you think. I pray that you don't lack the spiritual gifts that God has, that he strengthens you, that you'll be blameless, that you'll know that God is faithful, that you are called by him in fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. See, Paul lays a foundation for this church that's heavy. He says, this is what I am telling you, this is what I preach to you, this is what I believe. He's writing this book from Rome. He's writing this this letter to the Corinthian church while he's sitting in Rome. He's writing this and he's saying, look, I am telling you, these are what are true about God. And before I kind of lay into you about some issues into your life, before I kind of go into some problems that I'm going to address in the church that you're not going to like me talking about, and you're not going to like what I have to say about the way things should work and the way God has said for it to work, I've got to take you back and give you the full reminder and picture of who God is. Because if you forget that, then what you're going to do when I start telling you these things in this book is you're going to chase after those things, doing works to try to get in good with one another and to try to get in good with God instead of remembering that it's God that's done it all. That's why he starts the first part of this book thick in theology. And then he goes on, He talked about the cross there at the beginning. Then he goes on, we looked at last week, about foolishness and understanding. And he says, now I urge you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree in what you say, that there be no divisions among you, that you be unified with the same understanding and the same conviction. Instead, God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God has a way of turning everything upside down. He has a way of taking our pride and our boasting and turning it and humbling us. Have we not seen that in our culture? How much more do we need to be humbled before we wake up? How much more do our experts need to be humbled that they don't have a clue what they're doing and our leaders that they really don't have a clue what they're doing till we wake up? We keep trying to find hope in the next guy, the next treatment, the next thing, the next relationship, and God is saying, okay, keep, that's foolish, Here's true understanding about me. You you got a choice to make. And Paul writes and he says there shouldn't be divisions about the gospel. Now, should there be divisions? We remember, we looked at this last week. You can go back and listen to the sermon. But Jesus said he came to bring division. That he was going to divide people on the basis of a relationship with God. Either you know him and you're part of the family or you're not. You either have the DNA of Jesus or you don't. It's not kind of if, maybe. It's you've either surrendered and he's your Lord and Savior or he's not. There's no playing around with God. And Paul lays that out this week. 
What we want to look at is wisdom. Wisdom. Let me ask you, who do you trust? Who do you consider wise that you trust, and why do you consider them wise? Because they have a degree after their name? Do you realize that our space program, okay, our space program that got us into space and beat the Russians, happened because we gave a pass to 1,200 Nazi scientists so that we could beat the Soviet Union. It was called Operation Paperclip. You can look it up. Documents were declassified in the 90s. We literally told Nazis, some of them in charge of concentration camps, that as long as they helped us get into space, we would forgive them and we would not hold them accountable for the deaths and the sins and the atrocities they committed. Because, well, there's a greater good to beat the Soviets into space than to hold people accountable for murdering thousands and millions of people. You see, who do we trust? We trusted these people. We, most of what we understand about human biology and science, most of that came from a lot of the experiments that the Germans did on the Jews that weren't being done anywhere else. Do you realize that the Kinsey Institute, Alfred Kinsey, Kinsey Institute at Indiana University, most of Alfred Kinsey's basic knowledge that he began to teach in the 1950s where he wrote his book that came out that was so popular and transformed all of sexuality, which is where we are today. Bloomington is the hub of how we know about sexuality in the world. Did you know that? Did you know that Alfred Kinsey's studies, almost all of his studies, were him researching what Nazis had figured out in their abuse and mistreatment of Jewish children? And Jewish men and women. And these sexual experiments that they did on them. And again, they were given a pass. So that we could do research and have wisdom and knowledge. Because wisdom and knowledge are the greatest thing you could ever have, right? Not humility. Not death to yourself. Not sacrifice. Not surrender. No, 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 no. Getting for yourself more smart, more wisdom, more good. The atrocities that keep happening because we won't understand the wisdom of the cross and the wisdom God lays out is killing us, literally. Mental health is off the charts around the globe. We are in a disaster because we won't hang on to the wisdom of God. And Paul says in Corinth, it was no different in his day than it is in our day. And will we wake up? Will we go to God and believe that what he said is true? It says this in 1 Corinthians 2.1. Paul says, when I came to you, brothers, he's talking to the church. He's writing to the church, so he calls them brothers because they know Jesus, supposedly. Announcing the testimony of God to you. The testimony, testimony is the truth of God. It's what God has already done. A testimony is this is what was done. This is what was seen. He said, I came to you announcing the testimony of God. What's the testimony of God? The scriptures. I came to you announcing the scriptures, the testimony. Then he says, I did not come with brilliance of speech or wisdom. Because I did not think, or didn't, didn't think it was a good idea to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And remember, the name Jesus Christ means except Yahweh of the Old Testament who saves, who is the Messiah. That's what Jesus' name means, by the way. It's not first name, last name, title. Jesus Christ, Lord, is Yahweh who saves, who is the Messiah, who is Yahweh. It says the whole Bible, that's who he is. He came to be the Word. The Word became flesh. And so he says... I came not knowing anything. Do you know who Paul was? Paul was one of the most educated Jews of his day. He had Roman citizenship. That was so rare for Jews to have Roman citizenship. Very rare. He was, he was one of the highest educated religious people of his day as a Pharisee. He was off the charts. To be a Pharisee meant you had to have the entire Old Testament memorized. All of it. You had to pass a test showing that you had all of it memorized. And not only that, you had to also have other documents and other systems memorized so you didn't mess up the traditions that were added to the scriptures. 
And Paul says, none of that matters to me. None of that counts to me. I knew that if I came bragging about my wisdom, came with my degrees, came with all this stuff, I would be just like all the other charlatans that keep coming to Corinth to make a buck. So I actually chose the complete opposite of that. If that, that doesn't seem wise to me, does it to you? That seems foolish to come to IU and to work as a janitor when you have three doctorate degrees. Why wouldn't you try to get hired and get in there and get influence? Paul's like, nope. I just came to serve. I came to make tents for people. He went and became a tent maker, which is probably what his dad's profession was and he learned until the age of 12 when he went to college. He got accepted into college and then he went to college. He goes back to doing what his dad did, which was even considered kind of, oh, that's too bad you can't go to college and get a real nice job and a smart job. You have to go back and make tents because, well, God bless you. This is crazy what Paul is doing. And we need to pause for a minute and say, is this really, do I believe in my culture today that this is wise? To live a surrendered life like this, to be a servant, to do simple things is wise? I would say that that's not what our world tells us. Our world continues to tell us more is better, more is better, more is better. And Paul's like, I just came to you kind of emptying myself of everything so you would look at me and go, wait, you've got three doctors? You, you, you've got Roman citizens? Why are you making tit? Because I, I don't know what else to do but to live a simple surrendered life so that you'll see the gospel. I am not chasing something so I can be important so that you'll listen to me. I just came to be a servant. And everybody in this city, nobody wants to serve. Everybody wants to use. Sound familiar? To our day? He looks and he said, I came to you telling you nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. That the death of yourself and the death of the body is the only way for you to be healthy and for you to get to eternal life. The surrender of self, the the willingness, as Jesus said, to pick up your cross and follow me. And the cross was a sign of execution. It'd be like picking up your electric chair and follow me today. That you're willing to give your life, to surrender your life for something greater than yourself. And let's just be honest, this isn't what any any of us would choose. See, Paul knew that the beginning of real wisdom, the beginning of real wisdom was about a relationship with God. That it wasn't about gathering information, it was about knowing the person who had all the information. Right? Like, you can want to be wise all you want, but if you don't have the internet or a library, you're going to be in trouble. Paul's like, I know somebody who created it all. I want to hear from him. I want to be around people who listen to him, who study him, who know him. This is how the Old Testament says it. Look at this. In Job 28, 28, Job at this point is almost dead. He's lost everything. He's being tested by God, actually by Satan, if you read the book of Job. Job is miserable right now. He's got sores all over his body that he scrapes with pot shreds to to let him ooze out. He's lost all of his family. The only person God's kept alive in Job's life is his wife who keeps telling him to curse God and die because I want to be free from you. Thank you, God. Right? And Job writes this. He said to mankind, the fear of the Lord is this, wisdom. And to turn from evil is understanding. See, the fear of the Lord, the idea that I fear God more than anything else, I believe him over everything else, I believe his sacredness and what he wants more than I believe the other things, I believe that if I don't know what he wants, I'm in trouble regardless of what everybody else wants from me. He says that fear, that awe, that reverence, that oh, you're awesome, that is the thing that is the beginning of real wisdom. And he says, if you think you have wisdom, how evil are you? How wicked is your heart? Do you turn from evil because you want to understand what God has for you? Do you keep clinging to the evil and idolatry in your life because you feel like you're missing something because you don't understand what he wrote in the first chapter of Corinthians that God has given his life, his, son, his son's life for you so that you could be a part of his family? 
Psalm 111.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and all who follow his instructions have good insight. His praise endures forever. In other words, your praise won't. You could be the most famous, most powerful person in the world. You will be forgotten in just a few generations. You don't believe me? Name three of the greatest empires ever to exist in Asia. Okay, Europe. Okay, South America. You might be able to give me one or two. Now give me the name of the leader of those empires. Good luck. They're forgotten. You see, God says, if you know him, you will never be forgotten. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life and that he does not forget and you will have something that will endure forever which is praising him for how great he is. He goes on in Proverbs 1-7, the fear of the Lord, Solomon, the wisest man in the world, wrote Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and discipline. See, the only way you get to wisdom is discipline. And Paul is writing 1 Corinthians because he's trying to discipline the 1 Corinthian church because they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing and they're claiming to be wise while they're doing stupid. And he's like, you're not wise. You're dumb and foolish and it's going to cost you and cost others. And so Paul is here, he says, look, do you embrace discipline? Do you want the help of the body of Christ and the church to help you be disciplined in your life? Most of us don't. We don't want the help of the body of Christ to discipline us. We just want to leave us alone until we need you. We should love discipline because we know as we discipline ourselves, we become disciples. That's what discipline is. It's a a disciplined one. It's a disciple. And I want to be a follower. I want to be wise. And I know that the only way that works in my life is if I have discipline. You want to know why? Because I love to sit and eat chips and watch games on TV. That's not very disciplined. It's not evil, necessarily. It's definitely not disciplined. I mean, at least I should eat some carrots and celery. That'd be a little more disciplined. Right? We need help in this. He goes on in Proverbs, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Do you believe that? Or do you keep chasing more and more? Let me ask you, if you truly believe that wisdom from God is the most ultimate thing and his understanding is the best and greatest thing you can have, how much time have you spent studying wisdom versus studying all the studies that you study all the time? How much time do you spend reading the Bible or maybe even theology and things that talk about Scripture versus the news? And all the other things that are coming across. How much, how many TikTok videos have you watched, right? And YouTube videos versus just spending time in God's word or maybe even watching a film that maybe shows you God's word. How much time do you spend listening to praise songs and listening to God's word versus listening? Guys, if we really believe this, it'll change our time, our talent, our treasures, and it'll change the stories we tell, our testimonies. He goes on and he says in Colossians, Paul says this, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Jesus. That's what he's saying there. I am saying this so that no one will deceive you with persuasive arguments. He says there are those that are trying to persuade you to believe their wisdom, and I am telling you godly wisdom is better than all wisdom. Jeremiah 9, 23 Jeremiah is talking to God's people who have forgotten God's wisdom. They're acting as if they don't even know God anymore. They've adopted the practices around them. And he says, this is what the Lord says. The wise man must not boast in his wisdom. The strong man must not boast in his strength. The wealthy man must not boast in his wealth. But the one who boasts should boast in this, that he understands and knows me. Is that your greatest boast? Or do you love to talk about all the other things you've learned and done and brag about? Or do you truly love to boast in him that I am Yahweh, showing faithful love, justice, and righteousness on the earth? For I delight in these things, and this is the Lord's declaration. Do you 
Do you love to find out God's faithful love and what love really means, not the false love we have in this world? Do you love to find out what God's true justice is or do you just go along with whatever the world says is justice? Do you want to truly know what is right according to God and according to his character or do you just want the government and the Supreme Court to tell you what's right or not? See, God says, I delight in those who see that I'm everything, that all wisdom is in me. That is my declaration. Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 2, 3, I came to you, he says, in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. Pause for a second. This is Paul. This guy's been on multiple mission journeys throughout the entire empire. This guy has seen God do miraculous things, even raise people from the dead. This guy has seen more than you and I could probably ever imagine or think we could ever see. He's experienced more. He's seen churches planted through him. He's been beaten. He's been shipwrecked. I mean, you can't. And he says, I came to you in weakness with fear and trembling. Let me tell you something. If you're going to make God's wisdom known, specifically making who God is known, you're going to do it with fear and trembling. I promise. I have never shared, only one time in my life have I ever shared the gospel or gotten into a conversation about who God is where there wasn't like a little bit of fear or trembling or angst or like, oh, do I want to say this? I don't know if I want to tell him this. Oh, I don't. Only one time, ever. And that was when I was on staff with a missions organization and I showed up at a college student's room and I, when I made the phone call, I was nervous because I called this guy. Because he wanted to meet with someone to talk about a relationship with God. And I called him and said, hey, let's meet. He said, okay, great. And it was a real, and I, from the conversation I had with him at the beginning, he was an RA. He had authority over the whole dorm. I thought, oh no, this could be bad. Maybe he's suckering me. Maybe I'm going to go in there and he's going to get me to share and be like, kick me out. You know, I, I mean, I was having all these thoughts and I show up in his dorm room. He's not there yet. And I'm like, oh no, what now? And then he comes walking down the hall. He's like, hey, sorry, I'm late. We go into his room and I'll never forget. We walk in and I try to do some small talk, some awkward, hi, I'm Matt, and I get his name, you know, the whole nine yards. And then all of a sudden, I go, you know, can I just ask you a question? He's like, sure. I said, if, if, if you were to die tonight, or I said, do you believe in eternity, that there's an eternal? He's like, yeah, I believe in eternity. I said, well, if you were to, to, to die tonight, what do you think would happen to you in eternity? What, where do you think your soul would go, go? And he looked at me and he goes, well, that's why I invited you here. Oh. I shared the gospel with him. He committed to Christ. He's still walking with the Lord to this day, serving his local church. He's an awesome believer, raising great kids for the Lord. Like, I've had that happen once in 26 years. (laughs) One time. Most of the time, it's with fear and trembling. So you're in good company if you feel the fear and trembling of like, I'm getting ready to share something because the cross and God's wisdom is offensive to the wisdom of the world. It's just offensive because it makes the world deal with their own hearts. It makes the world deal with the fact that they're not as strong as they thought they are. They're not as good as they thought they are. And they don't want to hear it. He goes on and he says, My speech and my proclamation were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a powerful demonstration by the Spirit, so that your faith might not be based on men's wisdom, but on God's power. Paul said, you know, people are constantly coming into Corinth, bringing their books, bringing their knowledge, bringing their new thing, bringing their way of doing church, bringing this, bringing this, bringing this. He said, I came in doing none of that. I came in just giving a powerful demonstration of the Spirit. Ooh, what was that? Was he like popping people in the head and they were like lifting off the ground? Was he like slaying people and they were falling down and convulsing? Was he healing people? Were people coming out of the ground? What was this powerful demonstration of the Spirit? Well, Luke 2.47 tells us what Jesus' powerful demonstration of the Spirit was in his life. When Jesus was 12 years old, it said that all those who heard Jesus were astounded at his understanding and his answers at age 12. He gets lost, they find him, his parents lose Jesus, which is a great story, you should read it sometime, they lost the Son of God. I think that's hilarious. If you ever lost your children or forgot them, hey, you're in good company. And he says, he looks at them and he says, why were you searching for me, mom and dad? He asked them, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Didn't you know where I would be where the wisdom is? Didn't you know I would be around the things of God and with the people of God? You were looking for me in the streets like I was going to go find a prostitute at age 12? Why didn't you come to the three days they look for him and they never went to the temple? Is that not the typical parent? Is that not like dumb? Like that was not wise. We should have just went to the temple first. Oh, there he is. No, we thought he's like out having a party. The son of God, really? You thought? 
It goes on and it says, but they did not understand what he said to them. Then he, look at this. So they've proven they don't understand. They've done the wrong thing, not by going to the temple first. And look at Jesus' incredible spiritual, spirit-filled response to this. He went down with them and he came to Nazareth and he was obedient to them. His mother kept all these things in her heart and Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and people. And that is how God the Father sums up Jesus' life from age 12 to age 30. 18 years, one verse. That is a powerful demonstration of the Spirit. See, a powerful demonstration of the Spirit is the willingness to lay down your life and be obedient when it doesn't give you the promotion as the Son of God to go on top of the temple and shine like an angel and call everyone to yourself. It's giving your life for others. And Jesus was willing to be obedient to clueless parents. It says it right there, they didn't understand. He was willing to obey them. He was willing to go back to Nazareth, which was the armpit of the Roman Empire. The worst, like, really, you're from Nazareth? I mean, that even says that in the New Testament. Could anything good come from Nazareth? Ugh. Like, he says he just grew. He, he just obeyed God for 18 years. He never sinned, just kept obeying, kept doing the right thing. How annoying that probably was to all of his siblings and people around him. How hated he probably was because he always gets it right. He always has the right answer. Every time, there goes Jesus, right? And yet he just grew. James says this, who is wise and has understanding among you? So you believe you're wise? You, you believe you want to be wise or have understanding? He should show his works by good conduct with wisdom's gentleness. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, don't brag and deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. There's so many people running around bragging, so many churches, so many Christians running around bragging, thinking they have all the answers, and the real answer that Paul says is just the foolishness of the cross. It's just a simple message. And it's one that people do not want to hear. So your books will sell as long as you don't ask people to die. As long as you don't ask people to give their lives for a messy bride, the church, people will buy your books. You'll become their favorite author. But the second you start telling people they've got to die to themselves, they've got to surrender, they have to, they're out. James says, for when envy and selfish ambition exist, there's disorder in every kind of evil. But the wisdom from above is first pure. Then it's peace-loving, it's gentle, it's compliant, full of mercy and good fruits, without favoritism and hypocrisy. You know what James is listing there? The fruit of the Spirit. That's the powerful demonstration of the Spirit. Here's what Galatians says is the most powerful demonstration of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit, that's where fruit's coming out. It's the demonstration that this thing I planted is now producing fruit. It worked. I fed it. I nourished it. Now look at what it's producing. And the purpose of fruit is to feed other people and plant new plants that can feed other people. That's the purpose of fruit. Paul says the most powerful demonstration of the Spirit is this. It's not healings. It's not crazy magic. It's not slapping people in the head. The most amazing demonstration of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. You can do as much of these as you want, as long as you want, and God won't stop you. Now, true love speaks the truth. It's painful. It doesn't just let people get by and do whatever they want to feel good. That's called enabling. That's not what God does. Self-control is self-control. I want to be controlled by God, not by myself. I want him to control me because myself goes places I don't want. I want God's version of peace, not the world's version of peace. I want God's kindness, which tells people the truth and keeps them from falling off a cliff, than my own personal kindness so people like me. I want real faith, not a false faith that I'm trying to make my faith work for me, but it's a faith that says, God, I work for you. You see, this is what Paul says, and he says, now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Again, that's the cross. Since we live by the Spirit, we must also follow the Spirit. 
We must not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. See, that's what the world does. The world becomes conceited. The world provokes one another, right? That's politics, man. It's poking the bear, provoking each other, envying one another. Oh, well, they have it. Why can't I have it? That's not a powerful demonstration of the Spirit. A powerful demonstration of the Spirit is a surrendered life. God, my life is yours. What do you want me to do today? I will read your word. I will obey it. When I fail, I'll come back to you and say, I didn't obey it. And you'll say, I know, and I love you, and I give you grace, and I forgive you. Let's go again. Let's... That's the God we serve. And that message was just as unpopular 2,000 years ago as it is today. Look at verse two, or verse 6, chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians. However, we do not speak a wisdom among the mature, Or we speak a wisdom, sorry, we do speak a wisdom among the mature, but not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. On the contrary, we speak God's hidden wisdom in a mystery, a wisdom God predestined before the ages of our glory. None of the rulers of this age knew this wisdom, for if they had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Paul's like, people who understand this wisdom aren't looking to kill other people. They're looking to place them and have them place their faith in Christ's death for themselves. Paul says the wisdom is a wisdom of this age that we keep changing. He says there is a hidden mystery wisdom. Paul talks about the mystery of the gospel. It's the idea that if you want to gain your life, you must lose your life. That is the most unpopular thing in our world today. Our world says, we got to keep giving you self-esteem and make you feel better about yourself, and people keep feeling more miserable about themselves. And at some point, you go, you know what? I am a miserable wreck. I am a disaster. I have nothing good to offer. I am a mess. God save me. And that's when God comes in and he gives you all of the value that he has. He shows you all that he wants you to do. He gives you a home and a confidence and a family that you don't earn, you don't Prove yourself, you just surrender to him. And he looks and he says, if you really have biblical wisdom, why do you keep crucifying Jesus over and over again? See, many of you in this room, you keep crucifying Jesus over and over again. What do I mean? You don't believe he actually loves you. You don't believe that he could actually forgive you and have grace on you. You don't believe that he could actually help you learn and be wise. You don't believe that he would give you a family of believers. Again, all different families are different sizes. Our family's kind of small. It's like we have one kid. Some families, like the family we know, they have 12 children. 12. One of the daughters just had a child a year after her mom had a child. That's a lot of kids. That's a big family. It doesn't matter the size of the family. It matters, do you believe you're a part? Have you surrendered yourself to be a part of the family? Have you given yourself and said, this is my church family. This is the family I'm going to be a part of. And then you don't leave. You don't quit on family. You continue to serve and give yourself. You challenge. You, when there's a dispute, you come together as a family. You discuss it. Sometimes there needs to be another counselor that steps in. Sometimes there needs to be a a separation for a little while so you can kind of get help and then come back together because of the problems or addictions or issues that you have. This is all how we do normal family, but then we come to the church and we think, oh, church shouldn't be that way. Read the letter of 1 Corinthians. It's a disaster. These people are a mess. And Paul's writing to them because he loves them. In Genesis 3, 6, this is what Eve and Adam did. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delight, so she looked to, delightful to look at, and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. You see, Satan tempted them by showing them that there was a wisdom they didn't have and they couldn't trust God for. You listen to me and take the wisdom I'm offering. Sure enough, she took it. Some of its fruit and ate it. She gave it to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And then the fruit of that wisdom keeps reproducing and produces the world we live in today. And God says the only way that you're going to get out of that fruit is to be born again. To die to yourself and to start over a new seed, a new planting, and to grow into something that he does instead of chasing the wisdom that Adam and Eve chased their whole lives. Proverbs 28, 26, the one who trusts in himself is a fool. And yet that's what we tell people today. Trust in yourself, the good in you. 
but one who walks in wisdom will be safe. Isaiah says, you were secure in your wickedness. You said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and knowledge led you astray. You said to yourself, I exist and there is no one else. I'm so special. You're not special. You're really not. You're just a human. You're just cells. You'll be gone tomorrow. People will forget you. I pro- Your own people will forget you. I don't even know my great-grandparents' names. You'll be forgotten that fast. That's kind of depressing. Unless you believe the Bible. And unless you believe there's a God who says, even though the world teaches you that, even though the world is miserable and empty, even though the world makes you think you exist and there's going to come a day when you're done with and you're, you're sent away, I am telling you that I'm inviting you into a different kind of relationship in the world you live in. One of value that I created you and I want you to know I love you. But God has to have justice. And that justice will either be paid on Jesus or it'll be paid on you. He goes on and says this in verse 9 of 1 Corinthians, or 2 uh, Second Corinthians says, But as it is written, as it is written, this is Isaiah 64 that Paul is quoting here. What eye did not see and what ear did not hear and what never entered the human mind, God prepared this for those who love him. Now God, who has revealed these things to us by the Spirit, for the Spirit, searches everything, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of man except the Spirit of man that is in him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received the Spirit, or we have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who comes from God, look at this, so that we may understand what has been freely given to us by God. The cross of Jesus, his death takes our place so that we can understand that we don't get anything without him, that it's all about him. It's all about what he gives. It's his grace, and and we submit to that because we believe that he has our best interests in mind. We believe that he's revealed to us in his spirit. We believe we're a part of a heavenly family, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and the body of Christ. And because of that, we begin to understand what's been freely given. And you ready for this? Tune in. I stop trying to earn everything all the time. I stop chasing things. And I just sit in the reality and I understand what God continues to freely give me. Because he loves me. And when he tells me no to something, it's because he's probably trying to do something in my life and I can trust him because there's something better that he's going to give me. And ultimately, he gives me everything. A new body, a new life, a new home, a new earth. All of that is coming. Can I just tell you, that is a foolish message to those who are perishing. You really believe that? I don't have any other choice. Every other message out there is empty promises. I trust him. I trust a God that sent his son, that from the beginning he said, I would come and pay the price you can't deserve. I can trust him because he does what he says he'll do every single time without lying, without deceiving, without manipulating. He goes on and he says this. And Isaiah, Isaiah says, then a shoot will grow up from the stump of Jesse. That's talking about Jesus. Jesus was born from the line of Jesse, the line of David. And a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. A spirit of wisdom and understanding. A spirit of counsel and strength. A spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And his delight will be in the fear of the Lord. Jesus delighted in teaching people how to have awe and reverence and and just look at the heavenly father. He delighted in going to the cross, the scriptures say. He he took joy in being able to lay down his life for you and me because he knew that he was acknowledging that everything that was ever taught in the Old Testament was being fulfilled. So all knowledge, all counsel, all strength, all wisdom was coming true and he was the one it was coming true through. That was the plan. And so his delight was in doing that, knowing that his father would raise him from the dead. That is an incredible message. And it doesn't say, look, it doesn't say the Spirit of God was on him and he healed people and he made all... In this passage, Isaiah's like, no, these are the simple things. Knowledge, understanding, counsel, strength, fear. See, he didn't fear the Romans, which is why he could be crucified by them. He didn't have to try to manipulate the circumstance to get out of jail, to get out of trouble, to get out of things. He's like, nope, if that's what you want to do to me, then do it to me. You're wrong. It's evil. You'll be held accountable but I'm dying for you. That's so weird. 
That's not what we're taught. We're not taught to lay down our life. We're taught to get life. Isaiah says that's not the one who came. That's not the one we follow. In verse 13, it says, We also speak these things, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual things to spiritual people. Let me ask you, are you a spiritual person in Christ? Have you surrendered to the Spirit of God and you're going to stop trusting your flesh and your desires and your wants and all the things? You're going to stop pursuing all that garbage and you're finally just going to say, I surrender? Let me tell you, it's a constant surrender, right? Pick up your cross daily. It's a constant surrender, but have you done that? Because if you do, God says, through the body of Christ, through His Word, through the circumstances in your life, you will begin to understand spiritual things that Buddha and Muhammad and all the other religious people chased after and never found. And he says, but the unbeliever does not welcome what comes from God's spirit because it's foolishness to him. He's not able to understand it since it's evaluated spiritually. The spiritual person, however, can evaluate everything, yet he himself cannot be evaluated by anyone. In other words, it's not that we can't evaluate one another, it's that God is the one doing the evaluation, not other people. That when I come to you and I say, hey, I'm concerned for you, you have to question, okay, is he coming to me to manipulate me to try to get me to do something he wants? Or is he bringing the word to me and evaluating me not from what Matt thinks, but from what God says in his word? Does that make sense? Then he goes on and he says, for who has known the Lord's mind that he may instruct him? Look at this. Underline this in your Bible. Circle it. This is a huge statement. But we have the mind of Christ. Don't skip over that. God's desire is for you to have his mind, his thoughts, his ways, on whatever level your mind can go to. You know what amazes me? In many churches, I've been in multiple churches, but in a couple in particular, I remember there were some Down syndrome children in those churches. You could not find children more with the mind of Jesus than those kids, those young men and women. They didn't care if a pandemic was going on. When they walked in the door, they ran to you and they grabbed you and picked you up. They weren't concerned about their own safety. They just wanted to serve and love people and smile and know the people around them. Uninhibited. They were full of the Spirit of God, and you could see it all over them. And yet the ones that were wise, walking around, I don't know, I don't know, they're in bondage, and they're just free. See, God uses the foolish to confound the wise. He takes the foolish things of the world and says, why aren't you, why don't you have the simple faith of a child like that? Why can't you trust? Why can't you give yourself over to God and his people and his body? Why are you constantly trying to figure things out? Just trust what God says. So many kids like the Downs, they just do what you tell them. They can be manipulated terribly. I've seen it happen. It's awful. But they're also just joyful just to do what what they're told. Be obedient. Okay. Where is that in our churches today? Paul says, where is that in you? If you have the mind of Christ, you'll be like Christ. And if you're not being like Christ, why? What's happened? Romans says it this way. Paul writes in Romans, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, if you understand the mercy that God has had on you, if you understand the mercies of God, he says, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Problem with a living sacrifice is it can crawl off the altar. Right? Gets a little hot, jump off the altar. Don't want to die anymore. He says, holy and pleasing to God, this is your spiritual worship. Your spiritual worship is simple. You just offer your body again today. Here I am again today, Lord, this body. Not real great, but it's yours. Do what you will with it today. It's all I got to offer. Right? Then he says, don't be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you renew your mind? The word. Other believers, that's how you renew your mind. And then he says, but be transformed so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. 
The reason we don't know what to do, the reason is because we're not discerning from God. We're discerning from what everybody else tells us. Every news outlet, every political figure. Pause and say, God, what do you say? Then he says, you'll know his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Listen, you should think of yourself a little highly. You should think of the fact that you have a father who loves you and he is above all and I'm a part of him and that's the high thinking that you should have. This isn't, well, I'm just a miserable wretch, I'm nothing. No, that's not how God wants you to think all the time. He wants you to know how cherished you are, how loved you are. He wants you to realize that without him, you'd be that mess. He wants us to think highly of him and since his spirit's in us, then we think highly of one another when we're walking in the spirit. But he says, don't think too highly of yourself. (laughs) Don't get to the point where you're like, well, I'm super spiritual. He's a little less spiritual. Like, be really careful, he says. Then he goes on and he says, look at this. Instead, think sensibly as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. There's a measure of faith God has distributed to each one of us. There's a measure of faith that we've responded to with God and walked with him and we've grown in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man as we've walked with him. Jesus grew in in 18 years in a lot of wisdom, stature, and in favor with God and man because he walked more sensibly than any other human that ever existed. It says, now as we have many parts in one body and all the parts do not have the same function, you don't look and say, well, he and she, you just say, God, here I am. I'm yours. What do you want? You look to the body and say, what do you guys see in me? What do you see are my gifts? What do you see I need to work on? What do you... And then he goes on and he says, in the same way, we who are many are one body in Christ and we're individual members of one another. That there's a sense of surrendering ourselves and saying, if God says that I'm supposed to be a part, then I need to be a part. I need to be together. I need to not be a part, but together with people. That's where real wisdom is. Deuteronomy 5, 4 and 5 says this, when God was laying out the law for his people, he says, look, I have taught you statutes and ordinances as the Lord my God has commanded me, Moses is talking here, so that you may follow them in the land you're entering to possess. Carefully follow them, for this will show your wisdom and your understanding in the eyes of the people. Notice he doesn't say, this will show off and the world will think you're great and awesome. He says, no, no, no. This will show that you are trusting a wise God. And and it's supposed to be a witness to the world. And when they hear about all these statutes, they will say, this great nation is indeed a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God near to it as the Lord God is to us whenever we call to him? And what great nation has righteous statutes and ordinances like this entire law I set before you today. Do you even know what your Old Testament says? Do you even know how wise your Old Testament is? That the laws in the Old Testament are incredibly wise? We went through the book of Leviticus a number of years ago. We've preached through the entire, most of the Old Testament. I am telling you, the laws that are there are incredibly wise. There's a reason why, I've said this before, there's a reason why God says pork is a bad idea. In the New Testament, it's been made clean. Peter saw a sheet come down and God said, everything has been made clean now. So I eat bacon and sausage, full confession, just tell him. It is still the worst meat for you out there. It's terrible for your heart. Do you know how many antibiotics we have to pump full of pigs so they don't die and then spread disease to one another and then spread disease to humans, i.e. swine flu? Do you know how destructive pigs are to the environment and to our waterways because their poop is liquid and then it gets washed out into the waterways and can't be... They're a horrible animal for the world we live in. But God says the world you live in is being destroyed anyway. Eat pig and be happy. I mean, that's kind of the New Testament, right? But it doesn't negate that God's law isn't right. Right? God said, I've made it clean. You don't need to worry about it anymore. But you can't just say, pig's wonderful. It's beautiful. It's wonderful for the environment. No, it's really not. It's not. 
How about other laws that you read about? If you read some of the laws in the Old Testament about how to social distance and how we determine disease and mold. Did you know God had a mold policy in the Old Testament? Now we're scared to death of mold in our culture and everybody's panicked about it. Every home inspector, it's a big deal. God was like, yeah, I talked about that back in Leviticus. I told you to tear down homes. There was no way to get the mold out. You're just going to have to bulldoze it and start over. That's in the Bible? Yeah, way before they understood mold or germ theory or anything else, thousands of years ago, God's like, I love you. Here's some good laws. And you know what the people of God did? Well, that seems stupid. Nobody else scrapes the mold off. They just scrape the mold off. They just leave it there. It's not hurting us. It's no big deal. A few thousand years later, we're like, actually, it's a big deal. We understand germ theory. God was kind of wise to give that law to his people. Maybe we should consider that. Deuteronomy says, I'm, I love you enough to give you wisdom in the world you're living in. And why is it that you reject it all and then all of a sudden wisdom comes along and you go, oh, look, God was right. Oh, look, God was right. Oh, look, God was right. 2 Timothy 3.12, as we wrap up, says this. Paul's writing to Timothy. It's his last letter to this young man who's going to take over all the churches, including overseeing the church in Corinth. And he says, in fact, all those who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. People will think you're stupid for the way you do your life. Evil people and imposters will become worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, Timothy, continue in what you've learned and firmly believed. You know those who taught you, and you know that from childhood you have known the sacred scriptures, which are able to give you wisdom, look at this, for salvation through faith in Christ. He says the purpose of the scriptures is to give us wisdom to understand what really saves us so that we can help people place their faith in Jesus. That's that's what the scriptures are there for. To lead us all to the same family and to the surrendered heart. As Paul wraps up in 1 Corinthians 3.1, he says, brothers, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as babies in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, because you were not yet ready for it. In fact, you're still not ready, because you're still fleshly. You do what feels good. You do what pleases your flesh. For since there is envy and strife among you, are you not fleshly and living like unbelievers? See, there's some of you in this room who are unbelievers. You've not, maybe online, you've not surrendered your life to Jesus. You've not said, I'm done, I surrender. And there are some of you, as Paul writes here, that if not, you keep rejecting the wisdom of God and you keep just taking milk, which is kind of getting you through, but you have no teeth, you can't even chew food. And Paul is writing, and we'll see this next week. He's saying, if you understand the wisdom of God, you'll understand that you die to the flesh so that you can live for Christ. You understand that Jesus gave his life so that you could have spiritual life, and the life in this world would make sense as you give your life. And can I just tell you, that message is foolishness to a world that's perishing. And Paul said, even though I know it was foolish, I know that God uses the foolish to confound the wise, so I came to Corinth with only that message. I'm not trying to be wise and slick and smart. Listen, if you're scared, if you're a believer here today and you're like, I'm always scared to share my faith. Paul said he was scared to share his faith. Fear and trembling. Paul said he just came knowing simple things. Here's what I know. Ah, stupid. Okay, have a nice day. I mean, you're in good company because the... You're looking for people that God is working on in his spirit. And if God is working on you right now or in this room and he's speaking to your heart about your fleshly desires that you haven't surrendered as a believer, that you're a babe in Jesus, or maybe you don't even know him, or if he's speaking to your heart as a believer and you're like, man, I've seen the spirit work and I just so celebrate how he's changed me. And I don't want to think too highly than I should, but I do think pretty highly right now of what God's done. Man, celebrate that. Confess that you're not where you should be. And God says he will come in and bring his grace as a free gift. He doesn't draw away from you. Jesus came from heaven to the sinful mess of earth so that he could draw us into relationship. 
So that we wouldn't chase other things, but we would see that he came after us. All the other gods say, work to measure up to me. Only the God of Christianity said, I came from heaven to earth because you could never measure up to me. And now if you trust me, you will measure up to me forever based on me. That's the message of the cross. So will you surrender your life to Christ? Will you celebrate if you have surrendered your Will you stop complaining and be like, God, I keep complaining that you keep helping me die to myself. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thanks for helping me. Thanks for loving me. Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning for this word. I thank you for those that are here. Lord, I thank you for this message that is from the beginning that you said that one would come that would pay the price that we deserve. You said that back in Genesis. Jesus, thank you that you are the one that comes to pay the price and it's your wisdom we need to chase after. Father, forgive us when we chase after the wisdom of this world. Forgive us when when in arrogance we refuse to listen and learn and understand and read your word and try to, to grapple with what's happening, but instead we just pick a side or choose a side because it pleases our ideas and our thoughts and our flesh. Father, help us not to be babies, but help us to be mature in you. And to understand what it means to have a relationship with you. That we're not just laying in the house crying all the time, wanting to be fed. Having you clean up our our mess because we continue to make a mess of ourselves. But help us to mature so that we can then care for others. Lord, thank you for a spiritual family. Thank you that you sent your spirit to help us in this process. So that we can gain the wisdom that we need to live in this world. Help us. Father, to do that. Lord, I pray that if anyone here has not surrendered to you, if they've not embraced the foolishness of the cross and said, I'm done, I'm tired of trying to figure it all out, and I just surrender to believe that what God says is true, that he will save me, and I give my life to him. I pray today would be the day they do it. And they would see, Jesus, that you paid the price eternally so they don't have to, and then you leave us here so that we might be ones that pay the price so that others can see you just like you did. Lord, for those of us who are believers, I pray that if we've got an opportunity to celebrate today how you've changed us in your spirit, would as we gather together and sing, as we just celebrate what you've done. Lord, you want us to, to see who you are and we're grateful. We praise you. Thank you for our body. Though this family is small, I thank you I'm thankful that it's faithful. We give you praise in your name.